Hi, I'm Jessica, and when I'm not drinking all the coffee, watching Razorback sports, or hanging out with my family of boys, it's my passion to help elementary music teachers just like you find your unique teaching style. My goal with this podcast is to share helpful tips, strategies, and to give you the motivation you need to gain momentum in your teaching so you can continue being the music teacher rock star you already are. Welcome to episode 60. Today, I am talking to Justin Griffith, who goes by Mr. G, and you can find him on Instagram and Twitter at Key of Mr. G. And he shares with teachers how you can help your students compose and improvise, how to use iPads in the music room with GarageBand, and how he started a pitch percussion ensemble. But man, you guys, In this interview, so many amazing conversations were had that I feel like you will be nodding your head to. So I am so excited for you to listen to this episode. But before we do, let me tell you a little bit about Justin. After studying classical voice and graduating with a Bachelor of Music degree from the University of North Texas in 2005, he began teaching music at Vitovsky Elementary School in Midlothian, Texas. Since then, he's continued developing skills as an educator, songwriter, composer, performer, and audio engineer. Music is the focus, but the ultimate goal is to teach children how to be good humans, building a comfortable and safe environment while providing a lifelong outlet for students is the foundation of his philosophy. So without further ado, I cannot wait for you to listen to this episode and let's jump right in. Okay, everybody. So I already introduced Justin in the quick intro, but I want to let him introduce himself a little bit more and expand on what I already said. So Justin, just take it away and tell everybody what you want them to know about you. Sure. My name is Justin Griffith. My my kiddos call me Mr. G, though. And um, I've been teaching at an elementary school, kindergarten through fifth grade for I'm about to start up my 15th year. And so, yeah, I began teaching in 2005 after graduating from University of North Texas in in Denton, and I've been at the same school ever since. And I also teach private lessons and and group lessons at a store called Stage Volume in in Midlothian. I've been doing that since 2014. And um, a couple of other things about me aside from, from teaching, I have a, a recording studio that I work in frequently that I built in in my loft here in Dallas, and um, also do songwriting and and performing on my own as well. So I pretty much do anything <laughs> musical that brings money in and makes me feel good about what I'm contributing. Yeah. That's <laughs> yeah. awesome. No, I love that because I feel like as music educators, you can have obviously multiple different passions when it comes to music. And so you, I feel like, I don't know. I just feel like as musicians, you want to do all the things. And so you're doing all the things obviously, but it's, you don't need uh-huh, to, be limited uh-huh. to just teaching in a, you know, in a school. Like, I feel like right. it's so important that you don't lose the musician side of who you are as well. Don't you? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, for sure. I, I see it. I see it happen a lot with, mm-hmm. with uh, colleagues and stuff and, it's sad when that happens, but you know, honestly, it came for me personally. It, it kind of came down to from from when I was a kid. I've I've always wanted to just make a living from music, mm-hmm. and as a kid, that looked a lot differently than what it looks like now. But I, at some point, made a conscious decision that if I was going to do that, then I was just going to be open to anything music. I didn't want to pigeonhole my myself in in one little box, and uh, so that's that's kind of it helps keep me happy and engaged in in the different facets of of kind of like the musical uh, atmosphere, I guess you would say. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I feel like as music teachers, I feel like a lot of times, like you said, I've seen so many people too lose the musician side of who they are. And I feel like part of it is just the busyness aspect of, you know, like you said, we're teaching private lessons and in a school. And so how would you encourage other music teachers to find the time to just be a musician for themselves, even if they're not out there performing, but just even on their own time, just playing music that they still enjoy? Yeah. 
Well, I think it's I think it's a pretty it's it's a thin line that you kind of have to be very careful with. Um, but I would say you just have to force it. Mm. I mean, you can get engulfed in teaching to the point where you you can kill yourself doing it. Like <laughs> there's you're you're never you're never going to get everything done. Like you just have to shut it down at one point every single day. Like, okay, that's that's my my cap on today. I'm leaving. I'm gonna go do my life now, you know? And right. I mean, sometimes that feels very selfish because I think as educators we all are about giving and, and loving on the kids and stuff like that. But if if you don't take care of yourself, then you're not going to have anything to give them. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I just think you have to force it and be yeah. aggressive about it and, yeah. and just set hard lines with yourself. <laughs> I think that's so good. It's so true. It's, I mean, that, what's that statement? You can't pour from an empty cup. And so many right. times. I feel like teachers are just giving, 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 because that's what you do. You love your students so much. You just want to keep pouring into them, but you got to pour into yourself at some point as well. I mean, I think it's so. For sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Let's talk about you as a teacher. So what is, if you could pinpoint one thing, maybe you can, you can name multiple things, but your favorite thing about teaching music to kids. Um, I would say every once in a while it's it's the kid that you can you can really feel is gravitating towards something that they're going to grab a hold of and just keep with them forever and um and that's partly what attracted to uh, what attracted me to uh to teaching at an elementary school is is getting on the the ground level and and re- really kind of introducing young kids to something that they could potentially just, you know, embrace and, and be a, you know, an outlet for them for, for the rest of their lives. Cause that's what it's done. That's what it's done for me. And so it's, I guess it's just my way of, of feeling good about giving back and, and trying to present that to, to other people. Oh man. I love that so much. It's so hard because I've talked to so many elementary music teachers who you, uh-huh. you have to teach the objectives, obviously. I feel like sometimes we can get so focused on that, just covering all the objectives and what lessons to teach that you lose the reason you became a music teacher in the first place and you lose the uh-huh. heart behind it because it does. And so many more expectations are thrown on you each year. So it gets harder. Let's just be honest. Like, And so I feel like that's why some elementary music teachers end up losing their passion because uh-huh. they're not focused on making you know lifelong um lovers of music and their students it's more on focused on just teaching checking things off the to-do list do you agree with that a little bit I I do I do I agree with that 100% and um from from my experience and really over the the last couple of years I've gotten to the point where I don't really think of myself as a music teacher anymore (laughs) it's it's more like yeah I mean and and that hasn't I don't think that's been a a really conscious thing for me, but I've just, I've paid attention to how many fires that I put out like every day. Mm -hmm. And it it just feels more about teaching the kids about being good humans than anything else. Like, yeah, music is the basis of that and whatnot. But um, overall, I think the goal Yes, we have, you know, the legal obligations of of covering certain stuff, but at the end of the day, we got to we got to produce some good humans. Oh, true <laughs> so, story. <laughs> uh, that's got that's got to be in the forefront, I think of everybody's minds when you're when you're dealing with kids, you know. Mhm. That's awesome. Okay. I love that so much. Well, I'm going to shift gears just a little bit and I'm sure from you too, if you've met, you know, music teachers at different workshops and things, they, Uh they know that you, you know, you're pretty good at using technology in your classroom. And so, um, from the conversations you and I have already had through email and I know for me, that is one of the, I feel like biggest stumbling blocks with elementary music teachers or music teachers in general is Uh how the heck do I bring technology into my classroom? So overwhelming. So 
just start out with whatever advice you have for them. And then I have some, a few questions I'd love to ask you about that. Sure. Um, I get it. It's, it's difficult. I mean, honestly, I think anything, anything new is, is difficult for one. It's, it just hasn't been around very long. And, um, and even just starting to dip a toe into, into the water is, is overwhelming and something something that I struggle with a lot is being being a perfectionist Mm -hmm. and so when you when you do anything well not just with technology education in general like Mm -hmm. nothing is ever going to be perfect you can plan and plot and Mm -hmm. analyze and and draw out this beautiful plan or whatever but it's not going to happen that way um the the prepping and the planning is awesome but with technology i think i think you just have to take the step and um you have to allow yourself to mess stuff up <laughs> and um and not be broken over it and not freak out in front of the kids over it you just have to be honest be like hey we're trying something new yeah. it could be a disaster i don't know how many times that i've told my kids that like we're going <laughs> to try something it could be a complete disaster and it's okay because <laughs> we're going to figure it out at some point. So I think, I think overall just taking the step and learning with the kids and opening, opening it up to allow them to teach as well, because they, in a lot of cases, they just, they're just born with stuff that we haven't been born with. You know what I'm saying? Yes, it's just please. like, Wow they can figure it out pretty quickly. And so I, I ask the kids for help a lot too, you know? Mm-hmm. That's awesome. So just being open. <laughs> yeah. I love that. I feel like that's with everything as a teacher is just, uh-huh. you know, it's okay to not know how to do it. And like you said, I feel like that's sure. teachers think they do need to be perfect. And um, I love that in your classroom, you tell your students that I'm not going to be perfect. This may not go well. It's okay if it messes up because it's teaching them that in life, things aren't always going to be perfect either. You know, back to the life skills aspect yeah. of it. Yeah, Absolutely. that's awesome. So, sure. um, okay. So it, it's so true how technology has changed so much. I think back, um, I noticed that you graduated in 2005 and I graduated with, uh-huh. right, is that correct? Yes. Okay. And yes. 2004 uh-huh. and we had an education, what was it called? Education portfolio, this big giant binder. And so my <laughs> junior year of college is when they transitioned to putting it all online. I had to scan every single one of those papers. And that was my, honestly, this sounds so, it makes me sound so old, but my first experience with technology. And then I remember uh-huh. the first time they rolled a smart board into my school. Okay. Do you want to use it in the music room? And I was like, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I, just, I just can think of. I mean, even the teachers now that have all the technology at their disposal, it is still overwhelming because new things are coming out all the time. So you feel like you just don't know what to do. So um, like, okay, for instance, let's talk about composing in the music room with technology. Some teachers want to do way more than others, but I just feel like part of it is it's okay to be you and it's okay to um, use technology that you're comfortable with. And like you already said, you have to sometimes just try it to see if you like it or not. Do you agree? Uh-huh. With that? Yeah, for sure. For sure. And as far as the, you know, new technology coming in and, and out, I, f- I don't know. I feel like every single year there's more stuff coming in that we have to figure out and just a bit, a little bit for a moment. I, I get frustrated sometimes because we get new types of technology and we might get trained, but it's never geared specifically for, for us as musicians. Understandably so, because we're a lot of times we're the only, Mm -hmm. you know, music oriented person on the entire campus. So it wouldn't make sense to, to waste that time doing that. But I mean, it's, it's something that, I feel I feel like you have to reach out to other people to learn more about it instead of just keeping yourself on your campus, you know, reaching out to different music teachers and, and really doing doing some online research and stuff like that. That helps out a lot. Oh, totally. But um for for composing and, and that kind of thing with technology, I 
I think that I think that overall people when they hear the word compose, they a, a lot of times I, I think that we're like well, kids can't compose something because we, we think about this grand songwriting process mm-hmm. and, and you, so, you know, we think, well, maybe kids are not, are not capable of doing that, but that's not really true. I, I feel like, I feel like kids are composing all of the time. Oh yeah. Anyways, you know, at sports games with, with chants or I mean, even making fun of each other sometimes. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, <laughs> uh, I, I feel like they're they're creating a, a lot of times, beating on their desk with their hands. I know I used to do that as as a kid. I still do it. Um, but all of these little little bitty things, and and when you break down the different elements of of composition, it doesn't have to be rhythm plus melody plus lyrics plus arrangement you know all this extravagant thing it can just start with with hey here's some words you know say it to a beat i mean Mm -hmm. that in itself is is a part of composing is is putting a rhythm to pre-existing lyrics and and words and so breaking it down like that and and thinking of it in more bite-sized pieces is is helpful i think (laughs) Yeah, I I love what you said about, I feel like composing is intimidating to music teachers because, you know, if you've ever been classically trained or any, or trained on any instrument, no matter if it's classical or not, composing is, here's the composition, here's, you Uh know, here's an orchestra score with 107 instruments in it or whatever it is. (laughs) Right. Our musician brains immediately just go to that. And so when you think Uh composing, you don't think it can be as simple as kids improvising and just creating rhythms without even having to put it on paper. I mean, eventually at that point, but at first it can't just be as simple as, Hey, you guys, we just played the song together. Now I want you to improvise an eight beat rhythm um, with a by yourself or as a whole class. It can be as simple as that. But I agree. I think the word composing in itself does intimidate music teachers. So then they just never start. But Uh I love, yeah, I love your feedback on that. So how, okay, when it comes to composing music, when we've already broken down the word, doesn't have to be intimidating. So Uh um, give examples of how you compose with your students um, from like, you know, the first time you bring it up in the school year, for instance. Uh Uh-huh. Okay, so I think that freedom is a big part of it. Um, Kind of developing and, and creating an atmosphere in your classroom where it feels safe and kids feel comfortable with just going with stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and so one way to do that is, is to start with just improvisation and, and keep one thing that I, I can remember so many times where I messed up badly is with, um, giving them too much freedom. Mm. So, when I when I started um, lessons with improvisation and, and stuff like that, <laughs> you can't just be like, "Here, go." You you have to like, yeah. From my experience, anyways, I I usually give them, "Hey, work on." If I put a xylophone in front of them, improvise and create something from your own brain with these five bars right you cannot play any of the other bars and <laughs> use these rhythms you yeah. know and and keep it just super it, it's kind of like a a controlled improvisation I, I guess you would you would say but that's that's how I initially start with composition and and then slowly just kind of escalate something else that I mess with mess up with frequently I'm making myself sound horrible, but whatever. <laughs> no, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> We've all been there, done um, that. Trust me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's something that, that I make mistakes with frequently is is um, it's going too fast. And it's, it's easy to do that when you look and, and you see some of your kids feeling like they're looking bored or they're not entirely engaged and you want to, you want to kind of like speed things up to get to the fun part, but you, you end up leaving so many people behind and 
it's not thorough. And once you get to the activity, it, it just plummets. Right. And, and so I have to check myself a lot with slow, little itty bitty baby steps, you know, checking for understanding frequently and, and, and that kind of thing. But trying to just jump all in at once is always a bad idea. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I love that. I love that you give your students freedom to explore. And I mean, it's so true. Okay, so when it does come to improvising, yes, improvisation uh-huh. means, you know, creating music on the fly or, you know, there's so many different definitions. We'll leave it at that right now. But um, but it's okay to give your students simple instructions. Like you said, play on these keys or these, you know, these bars uh-huh. and I want you to play this many rhythms and it needs to have this many beats. So they need to have some rules. I mean, not like yeah. you know, compose a whole music score, but some rules to follow. Right. <laughs> so they like, okay, I need to stay in these parameters so they can, you know, follow uh-huh. that. I agree with that. That's really good advice. Um, because I feel like every teacher has done that. You're like, it's going to be the best lesson ever. And then it just gets overwhelming for the kids because there's just, I yeah, you go too fast. Yeah. And you expect them to yeah. follow you along and they're looking at you like, what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they get lost. True story. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Um, one other thing, I don't know why I just thought about this, but I always felt like <laughs> when a music classroom sounds like it is the most chaotic is when the most learning is happening. And I love getting uh-huh. the teachers walking by, giving these, looking in your room, like what's going on in there? Cause it sounds like you are literally just standing there going, everybody do whatever. Yeah, you know, yeah, there's just so out. much random noise coming from your room. And they're like, what's going on in the music room today? Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. So do you get For those sure. looks? I, oh, yeah, ab- absolutely. And um, <laughs> it, it's so frequent, too, because I, I'm a big believer in independent practice, too. And so, you know, setting something up and explaining it and talking about it, and then, all right, take the next minute, do your thing. Yeah. And at that point, it just erupts and sounds like, a disaster and chaotic and like nobody yeah just a free-for-all but yeah. <laughs> but that's okay as long as you can shut it down you know yeah, then yeah. it's all good but it's okay yeah so like if your principal walks in the room and you're like I promise there's a method to my madness just <laughs> right just keep on walking it's okay. <laughs> okay all right well let's talk about um garage band because I know you mentioned okay. that you like to use this and especially I'm very intrigued because you wanted to talk a little bit about how you use it with iPads and uh-huh. is that right yeah uh-huh. okay. awesome well I want to hear all the things about that so I'm just going to let you take it away with that because I'm very <laughs> okay <laughs> okay um all right garage band well let me back up so our district was very blessed And we recently um, got blessed with iPads for all of our students. And so we're a a one-to-one district. And so elementary level students all get iPads. And above that, they get laptops. And so when that happened, I was really excited and nervous and you know, scrambling, trying to figure out what I'm I'm going to do with, with, with it. Mm-hmm. But GarageBand has been such a awesome tool to use for all kinds of, of different reasons. And so, honestly, just walking students through all of the buttons in GarageBand is mm-hmm. so many different lessons, like, without even getting into the the really technical stuff of, of how to record properly in it and all of that. I mean, just by walking through the, the buttons and the different parameters, it's filled with like tempo, rhythm, instrumentation, notes, beats, mixing, multi-tracking, quantization, meter, keys, scales, just there's tons of stuff. Yeah. And there's, there's stuff that, that kids point out like, hey, especially if they have iPads to take home. I know not everybody's in that situation, but when when they have the freedom to to bring something home and just play around with it, they're going to bring it back to you and show you stuff. Absolutely, 100%. Um, but that's kind of where I start is getting them familiar with, with each of the buttons. And when you don't know what it does, I, and I tell the kids this too, um, when when they download a new app, 
They don't break out an instruction manual and read about it. They just start messing with stuff. Right. And pressing buttons and, and figuring it out. It's just, just like, um, you know, when, when students ask about the pedals on a piano, mm -hmm. I, I just say, go play with it and figure out what it does. Like, that's a better way to, I think, explain something to somebody is just go experience it and um, use your ears and all your senses and figure out what it does. You know right. what I'm saying? Right. And so uh, that's something that I do in GarageBand for sure. And um, there's going back to the composition and, and composing and stuff that that's something that I do within GarageBand a whole lot. So I can, I can think of a, a project that we did this past school year where we we started by setting up four instruments in GarageBand. And so like I said, baby steps. So this is this is along further in them being comfortable with it. But we ended up composing something that had drums, bass, keys, guitar, and then something vocal wise. And and once once you get into all of that, you you can start opening up different branches of music as well, mm -hmm. like audio engineering, which is something that I'm really passionate about as well. But um, like understanding what multi tracking is and what peaking is on on meters of you know in a recording studio and what mixing is and and how to balance what you're hearing and i don't know when i i can think back when when i was a kid i had no understanding of wait you mean i can record i can record something and then go back and while i'm listening to that i can record something over the top of it and yeah. then i can go back and listen to the i had no understanding of that and and so getting into the engineering part of it and, and opening up their ideas to different ways to be involved in music other than just being a musician, you know, uh, other than just playing an instrument or doing vocals. There's so many different things that you can do um, job wise or interest wise or hobby wise that don't have anything to do specifically with with being a musician you know mm -hmm. such as being a producer right which is something that kids think is amazing right now for sure oh, um, yeah. like producing beats and mm -hmm. and especially with the hip-hop and 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 whatnot so ah uh, there's there's a i could probably do a full <laughs> podcast <laughs> episode on, on yeah, yeah garage band but they should probably start paying me because I'm been, I'm yeah. like a big believer in it, and it's such. Mm -hmm. I think it's such a um, a user friendly platform, and um, I don't I don't think it's it's super complicated. Sometimes yeah. when you put when you go into a recording studio or whatever, and you see this giant analog console with literally hundreds of buttons and rotary knobs and faders and stuff it's just it's overwhelming yeah but uh i don't think garage band and, and ipad i don't think it's set up like that you mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. no that's awesome i no i think that's awesome and that's what music teachers need it's just something that's not gonna overwhelm them because i am one of those people that sees all the buttons on a console and i just get uh -huh. scared because i just stared at like what do i do <laughs> For but, sure. Uh, yeah, it's overwhelming. <laughs> it is. It is. Something, if if you don't mind. Um, yeah, no, go. Something you just reminded me of is I when I think about those consoles and stuff, I think about a piano. And mm -hmm. so when when I sit down with a kid at, at a piano, I can see how overwhelmed they look because of how many keys there are. Mm -hmm. And what I always bring it back to is like the key the the piano or the keyboard whatever you're looking at it's really only like this many keys right. and then it's just right. repeated right so it's this i mean same thing with the consoles it's like once you know what 
a vertical strip of most of those things does it's just repeated yeah so <laughs> yeah like bringing it back to that for sure that is good to know um, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I always look at those and I'm like I don't I don't know what to do with mm-hmm. that um, yes oh I, I had a question to ask you and I forgot um let me think real quick um mm-hmm. good grief with garage band I'm going to have to come back to that question because I totally forgot what I was going to say, but I'll sure. remember in a minute. Okay. But, cool. okay. So real quick, if you, if there is a music teacher listening to this that does not have a class set of iPads and maybe they only have one even or a few, what are ways that you would encourage them to still use GarageBand or any, you know, kind uh-huh. of technology on the iPads in their classrooms? Yes. Okay. So let me let me kind of go back in my head a little bit because I haven't been I haven't been in that situation in in a couple of years at this point. Right. Um, fortunately, um, but I think a simple way to incorporate it is setting up stations. You know, if you only have one iPad or or just a few, set up multiple stations, some instruments over here. You know. Yeah, stations. Y'all know what's up. Oh, totally. oh, <laughs> but, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, that's a that's an easy way to to incorporate. Um, there's also things that that you can, depending on if you have a projector or or one of the smart boards or anything like that, you can project the uh, what's on your iPad screen onto the projector or onto the the smart board. Mm-hmm. So, kind of walking walking them through things and incorporating. Um, I love doing rhythm activities uh, in GarageBand because you can you can make it so fun. Okay, so here's a here's a an example. So you break down the elements of of a drum set, and you have them record a kick drum with this rhythm, like something very basic, just like um, one, three. And then you go back in on another track and have them fill in the snare drums and it's the exact opposite rhythm. And so, um, and then you go back and add hi-hats with just solid eighth notes across the board. And like you, you use all these super simple um, rhythms to create, to record, and then you put them all together and it sounds like a full on drummer playing. Yeah. And so the way to incorporate that is, I feel like kids love to watch other students do it more than they like to watch you. Right. <laughs> right? Oh, true. Yeah, so, definitely. Yeah. So um, having it reflected on a projector or a, a smart screen or, or whatever, you can pull kids up individually where everybody else can see what they're doing on the screen. And you give, hey, you're going to do this rhythm on this part of the drum set, cool, go. They're gonna make some mistakes. We're gonna critique it. We're gonna talk about what they need to do to fix it. We're gonna press undo, and then we're gonna do it again. And Mm -hmm. so once we get that solid, you know, have them choose someone else, pull up. Okay, you're gonna do this rhythm on the snare drum now. Boom, go for it. Allow them to do it. And so you, um, that's just something that popped into my head that, even if you had a single iPad, a personal one, or one that, that the school has provided, that's an easy way to kind of incorporate it and, and keep yeah. the kids engaged. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, I know what I was going to ask you now. Um, okay. I was going to say, so it, it has something to do with GarageBand, but also the, something that you said that really that I really liked. I feel like you showing kids how there's multiple w- things they can do with music as they grow uh-huh. up so important. Um, I feel like there was a turnaround with my students whenever they noticed that when we started talking about, um, I taught in a very urban school. And so the kiddos, you know, they didn't want to just talk about classical music. They didn't want to just talk about, you know, I could be a singer when I grow up or not that there's anything wrong with that. But I think showing them that, um, especially the world we live in now, the kids really, really, you know, when it comes to popular music, showing them that the other side of the music world, not just the musician side, but like you said, the audio side as well. I think that's uh-huh. that you're doing that because I feel like I can just imagine how much engagement you're getting in your classroom from your kids by showing them that 
other side of the music scene as well. Uh huh. Are you seeing that more from them since you, you know, since you I do them a little bit? Yeah, I think I think it it has a lot to do, like you said, like you teaching in a, in an urban area. I, mm-hmm. I think a lot of it depends on where you're at, what your clientele looks like. Right. Um, like even the crazy thing, even within our district, just from elementary school to elementary school, the the you know the the clientele, the the students are so different in mm-hmm. in their interests and stuff. Like I have, I've personally had a um, a difficult time with with incorporating anything choral or any singing. Like once once the kids get in fourth grade, even yes, like I've I've been having a hard time getting them interested in in um, in singing at all. Yeah. And so I think that every school has its struggles with with interests and stuff, but. Um, if you kind of open yourself up mm-hmm. to to pay attention to where the kids are, where their interest does lie, I think that kind of guides you and it, it helps you design lessons better. Yeah. No, that's <laughs> you know? great. Yeah. And meeting your students where they're at, because like you said, sure. teaching at even a different school down the street will be completely different experience because of uh-huh. your teaching. I think that's awesome advice. Okay, so I want to talk about, um, you told me you had started a percussion ensemble at your school, and, or is this at your school, or is this something you do for yourself? Yeah, it's, it's at my, it's at my school, um, it is something that, it's something I, I enjoy, and so this kind of goes back to what we discussed earlier, kind of finding ways to feed yourself, and, and keep your cup full. Right. I, I have to I have to do that. So the percussion, the pitched percussion ensemble that I have is something, yes, I do it at, at school, but it's something that I do as far as like composing, arranging and, and songwriting. I do it for myself too. And it helps keep me engaged. Mm-hmm. I think I think everybody gets obsessed with student engagement, but I mean we have to stay into what we're doing too. Yeah. And sometimes we get burned out and have to trick ourselves into, you know, getting back into what we were into at one point, and then we right. just got burned out. Yeah, and don't so need that, your energy completely. <laughs> for sure, for sure. And and so, um, yeah, that that ensemble is is a way for me to 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 really get into what I do. It's one of my favorite parts of of teaching. And so I'll tell you a little bit about it. So it's called, it's called Mission Musician. And the, let's see, the, the first year that I taught, when I got hired, my principal wanted me to do an after school program. And that was kind of like one of my obligations that I had to do. And in the past, there had been um, an orchestra is what they called it. Oh, yeah. And I was like, okay, cool. I'm going to go with that. And so I kind of rolled with it, had a few instruments, xylophones, metallophones, and, and glockenspiels. And, um, and so I just went with it. But I guess as I went on and kind of got more comfortable in my shoes and where, where I wanted to go personally, I wanted to start changing things and, and developing my own ideas and just making stuff mine instead of totally taking yeah and so I you know that's when I came up with the name Mission Musician I'm I'm really into hip-hop and and am a songwriter in in that genre as well so anything alliteration or or rhyme I just I love it and so Mission Musician was something that that I started a couple of years later it was an after school program, then it was a before school program. Now I'm actually incorporating it during the day in our, our genius hour stuff that we do on Fridays. But um it took it took a while to build up a decent amount of those instruments because they're so ridiculously expensive, oh. right? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so expensive. But um yeah, I 
like I said, it's it's one of my favorite parts of teaching. Something that I, I started doing many years ago is um, I straight up just ask the students that are involved what their favorite songs are at that time. Mm-hmm. And we just we just make a long list of, of songs that people are into. And, um, and we end up voting on, you know, what the top five are or whatever. And then I'll go back in. Sometimes I know the songs and sometimes I've never heard them before. And I'll go back in. Sometimes they're appropriate. Sometimes they're not. <laughs> yeah. but, um, <laughs> um, but the cool thing about doing an, an instrumental group is you don't, you don't have to pay it too close attention to how appropriate lyrics are and stuff like that because they're not going to be present oh totally but um yeah but um it's it's fun because once once we decide on the songs i'll listen to them and see if they can kind of be massaged into being arranged for that kind of instrumentation and so it's fun for me the kids are invested in it because it was their decision and then most of the time I'll work in one or two of my pieces that I've I've written, which is exciting for me. And they get excited because it's it's something original. And I don't I don't know. It's it's just a really cool dynamic that's that's been built over the years. And and um, I I absolutely love it. <laughs> that's awesome. I know. I think that's just so great that you're doing. Um, you're teaching music your way. And you're making it your own. And I, I mean, that's uh-huh. just something that I've seen a lot of teachers struggle with, especially if they're new teachers, following the footsteps of a teacher before them. And then you have the expectations, yeah. but Miss Blah 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 or Mr. Blah 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 did it this way. And you're sitting there. So uh-huh. you oblige like you did, but then yeah. you pay to make your program your own, which is what you're doing. For sure. Great. Yes. Yes. You're so, so right. And it, it took me a long time to get to the point where I was comfortable with doing that. I was so, I don't know. When I started teaching, I felt like kind of the, I felt like kind of like the black sheep. And I felt (laughs) like that when I was in college too, because my interest, yeah. I mean, at, at North Texas and I'm not downing anything, but just, I mean, it's, it's very, it's either classical or jazz. And yeah. that's it. And I had I had very strong interests outside of those genres, and I respected those genres, and I appreciated learning about them. But I didn't have a lot in common with um, with a lot of the the students that that I was learning with and whatnot. And I felt the same way when I when I started teaching. I, my interests were way different than a mm-hmm. an elementary music teacher you know yeah so right it took it took me a while to settle in and be like okay this is my I know what I'm doing mm-hmm. I can develop this and make it my own and make it different and make it kind of new school and kind of forget a little bit about what's done in the past but right embrace some of it and leave some of it and, and just push forward. And yeah, like you said, make it my own for sure. Yeah. I love that. I feel like, um, one thing I've talked about on this podcast is encouraging music teachers that it's okay to be you. It's okay. Yes. I feel like, and there's nothing wrong with this, but I I just keep it real. Like you've been doing, um, either there's a lot of music teachers that are pro or pro Kadai and there's, you know, and I just, I've always been under the impression like you are that, I'm going to teach with my style, bring in a little bit of that, a little bit of that, and a little bit of this. And a little, I feel like having um, your own teaching style is the most important thing about it. Uh Figuring out what works for you and what, you know, doesn't work for you and what you enjoy doing, what you don't enjoy doing. And one of the biggest pieces of advice I like to give teachers is it's okay to be different than the teacher down the street. You don't have to look the same as them and it's okay to make it your own. So I just... I love that you're doing that. I mean, honestly, kudos, big time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So last question before we go, um, I wanted to talk real quick, just give some advice to teachers who are maybe, maybe they're being asked to start, um, whether it's a pitched percussion ensemble, choir, or any other kind of, you know, after school or before school group. How would you suggest they get started? I know there's a lot that goes into that, but. Would, just any advice you have about starting a group like that? Yes. Um, well, anything, 
in, involving instruments, budget is a giant concern. <laughs> oh, like I mentioned yeah. earlier, I mean, those ORF instruments, them things are expensive. <laughs> they They're are so expensive. so expensive. And so that's always the the first kind of step and concern is, well, what do you have to work with? And if you don't have much, what kind of grants can you write? And what kind of, um, you know, what kind of fundraising are you able to do to get to a point where you have a decent sized group? And like I said, I mean, I think, I think it took me a good eight, probably eight years to get to the point where I had a significant amount of, of xylophones, metallophones, and, and glocks to, um, to feel like I had a solid group, you know? And so I, I think that's, that's the first step of, of figuring that out. The other thing is, I think this is super important is, is gauging the interest from the kids. I think, I think some people leave that step out. Um, and you know, you put, you put together notes and, and design all of this stuff and then it ends up flopping mm -hmm. and falling on its face because the interest isn't there. And, um, and so I think putting a little bit of, of research and <laughs> I'm starting to go into like marketing mode where you're, <laughs> you know, you kind of got to take samples of, of your, of your people and see mm -hmm. where, where their head's at. But, um, I think that's a part of it planning, planning, and, and figuring out something that is not going to kill you. Right. Something that almost killed me the first many years that, that I was teaching was doing an after school program okay. and, um, and, and dealing with the fact that, okay, well, I'm staying after hours for this amount of time. And then I'm staying there for this amount of time because people can't pick their children up on time and, <laughs> and you know that kind of stuff yes. you know putting some thought into into the details where you don't just run yourself down with it I think is super important um as far as choir goes same thing um paying attention to your clientele seeing what kind of repertoire that they're interested in because it might not be the same that you are and there's I mean I feel like there's a there has to be a balance of you're gonna learn this because yeah. you need to right and well let's be a little bit more open with what we could do over here you oh, know what totally. I mean yeah because sometimes so, it's, those are a few things yeah sometimes kids are just unfamiliar or they've just never yeah. experienced a certain kind of music so sometimes there will be pushback for those reasons but like for you sure. said I agree with you know yeah, there's a balance of finding out what are they like, what are they like, and what are you comfortable teaching and finding like a common middle ground. Um, uh -huh, uh -huh. So Justin, I have enjoyed this interview so much. Before we go, do you have any Ooh. closing thoughts or things you would like to say? Um, not too many. I appreciate you for reaching out and having me. Um, it's always cool to to chat back and forth about stuff that, that we're passionate about. Oh, <laughs> but um, overall, I just say, I hope everybody has a, a strong, solid school year and stay positive and keep fighting the good fight. And <laughs> um, remember to take care of yourself and, and spend spend some time keeping yourself healthy. And if anybody wants to reach out and chat or ask questions to me, you can find me on Instagram or Twitter. It's uh, at key of Mr. G. Mr. is just M-R instead of it spelled out. So, yeah, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Of course. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening in to the Elementary Music Teacher Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. And while you're there, I would love for you to review the show and leave a rating on iTunes. To find out more about how I can help you gain momentum in your elementary music teaching career, head to thedomesticmusician.com where you'll find free downloads, courses, the blog, and so much more. Continue teaching music and never doubt the impact you're making each and every day in the lives of your students.